you're under the supervision of Dr. Steve McGarry. Now, before we get into the details of the project, I kind of want to run you through the background of motivation as well, or why we're here and what we did. So from personal experience, I actually was diagnosed with a autoimmune disorder that left me experiencing physical rehabilitation firsthand for a while. And I understand that my situation is not unique. There are a lot of Canadians every day getting increasingly more diagnosed or do suffer from physical limitations inhibiting them in their day-to-day -day function. Now, if we fast forward to December 2013, I was actually after a long night of pool and foe with flat heart, or uh, teammate, sorry, Yannick DeMello, and he pitched me an idea of looking for novel assistive devices to offer alternative solutions to this problem with assistive technology in today. So we started researching. And we started looking, and what did we find? We found that modern assistive technology tends to be large and cumbersome. They have numerous gear systems, and they have rigid mechanical motion. It's not organic, and it's not natural. So what is ideal assistive technology? Well, ideal assistive technology should be ergonomic, comfortable, it should have smooth muscle-like motion, and it shouldn't inhibit you anymore in your day-to-day -day function. Now, a big issue is a lot of people don't want to become a super soldier. Some people just want to get a little more motion back at the end of their day. So what we found? Well, we found something I think will move you. That's electroactive polymers. Electroactive polymers are these viscoelastic polymers, or viscoelastic or elastic polymers, that allow the EV deformation in simple geometries like a par parallel plate capacitor. And it's in that moment that when they deform, they have a really nice uh, restorative force, it's conservative, returning a lot of energy to the system. And these polymer actuators provide uh, high energy efficiency due to that restorative force, and they also tend to be a lot, light, uh, sorry, a lot lighter in weight than their mechanical counterparts. So since this research into this tends to be a little bit newer compared to conventional motor systems, a fully functional system has not been realized yet. So to try and go about this, we had to break this project up into components, as you can see here. So I'll walk you through a little bit of what our project is. So here we actually have to develop the actuator itself, the muscles. So that was actually headed by Yannick DeMello, Scott Stewart, and myself, Colin Fernandez. And then next we looked for an actuating circuit, something to drive the actuator. And that was led by Elise Barre and Shapiro Bashkai. Next, we look for an intuitive control mechanism, a sensing circuit to take the information straight from the muscle. And that's where the team turned to electromyographical sensors or EMG sensors attached directly onto our arm. And Shavir and Elise also looked at that part of the project. And finally, we needed the brain of our device, the control center. And that was left up for Denai Fasal to actually build an Android program to do the processing for us. And collectively, we are the ATs. <laughs> now let's get into this. Okay, now let's talk about actuators. For our project, we explored two different types of polymers. First polymer we looked at were conductive polymer actuators. So CPAs actuate by a moving of ions, which cause a net change of volume. As you can see here, we have ions go from the right side moving onto the left side when we have an applied DC voltage. Now the problem with these actuators were they required a liquid or a gel electrolyte and also, after repetitive use, we found that after 10 repetitions, they just stopped working. So we moved onwards to dielectric elastomer actuators. DEAs, on the other hand, function more like a capacitor, as mentioned before, where a charge would accumulate on one of the plates when a voltage is applied, forcing it to the other plate, thus causing actuation. These materials also have the added benefit where a mechanical force is created when an electric field is applied across them. Now, we actually did a few simulations using the simulation software Consol, uh, where we checked different materials with different dielectric strength, as well as material properties such as the Young's modulus, and we compared them to find the overall actuation, as well as the electric fields and potential when we applied our voltages. So, this narrowed it uh, down to three different materials. One of them was Sogard 184, a silicone-based material, which is highly compressible as well as flexible and robust, so repetitive use is no problem. We also looked at a dielectric gel, which is also silicone-based, which is soft and malleable, and it's also easy to apply as an added protective layer for our actuators. We also looked at a VHB tape, which has a very high dielectric strength, it functions like a tape so that it's a lot easier to quickly make an actuator for testing purposes and other designs. So, yep. So let's 
see, there were a few problems, as you can tell, uh, with our uh, actuators. One of the problems that we had was that, um, just leave it. One of the problems we had were that uh, when we made our actuators to start with, they didn't adhere to the plates. The material didn't stick together because it was silicone based. Now the solution to this was we added holes into the act, uh, conductive layer so that when we applied the material it'd be one homogeneous solution with a bunch of conductive plates interspersed inside it. So when we applied the voltage it would actuate. Now this uh, led us onto more robust designs where we scaled it up. So as you can see on our leftmost, we have a spring actuator design with steel mesh. We also have with VHB tape and steel mesh an accordion design, which just uses two different conductive layers and wraps them around each other into a very large structure. And we also have a silver and steel mesh uh, standard stacked form which also goes onwards uh, to do the same thing. Now, unfortunately, this requires high voltage source to actually run the circuit. Right, I want to that. So, now that we have our actuators, we need something to power them. We, me and uh, Tabir, uh, with some help from Bonai, we designed an actuating circuit uh, that creates a supply for our uh, actuators. These dielectric elastomer actuators require quite a high voltage, um, about a thousand volts. So the challenge here was creating this thousand volt DC supply and triggering it with uh, an Android device, which uh, clearly doesn't uh, provide it with a thousand volts. One of the things we wanted to consider was safety. So we uh, limited the current at the dielectric elastomer actuator to 10 milliamps. Uh, this is because these actuators are um, removable and replaceable. So 10 milliamps is the let go current as specified by the National Safety Foundation. The let go current is a current that uh, you will still shock you, but you'll be able to let go, so it's uh, not lethal. <laughs> <laughs> One of the issues we had when uh, making this uh, uh, high voltage source is we wanted to trigger it with the Android device, which outputs 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. But we also wanted to use a CCFL transformer because uh, they're easily available and compact. And it operates between 40 kilohertz and 80 kilohertz. So our design overcame this frequency mismatch issue. Uh, and here is just the block diagram of um, the actuating circuit. We have our phone. Uh, we're using the headphone jack um, output because it's very uh, easily accessible. Uh, and it outputs at 10 kilohertz uh, and 0.7 volts DC. We then amplify this with an LM386, which also protects our Android, and we rectify this, and then we use uh, an oscillator. We use this signal as a trigger for our oscillator, which operates at a more favorable frequency, 66 kilohertz. So this is now we can put this through our CCFL transformer. Uh, we put a push-pull stage uh, so that uh, we got a bit of higher power to power our um, Actuators. Right, so to recap, the input now to the transformer is high enough power to overcome the internal impedances of the transformer. It's also in the range that we want it, in the 40 to, kilohertz, 40 to 80 kilohertz operating range, as opposed to conventional 10 kilohertz. So this allows us to get as close as possible to the ideal uh, amplification of the transformer, and our trim ratio is 1 to 100, so ideally we get 100 times voltage amplification. Um, of course, in order to get a DC signal out of that, you have to rectify it. So the, the LC spice simulation behind me, in green you have the high voltage oscillating output from the transformer, and in blue you have the rectified voltage that goes through a uh, high voltage diode with a full wave rectifier. And as you can see, that's over one kilovolt, so that's our intention. Um, everything before this point would have been placed in plotting and not accessible to the user. However, as Luis mentioned, the DAs are intended to be interchangeable, and as such, we have to limit the current in the wires connecting to the DEA. So we installed a current limiting resistor uh, to limit less than 10 milliamps. We actually designed it for 5 milliamps just to be extra cautious, um, and it turned out to be a 2 3 kilo resistance. Of course, the load on the circuit is the DEA. So this is what it looks like when you put the circuit together. Uh, you can see near Benike is the Android input uh, feeding into the audio amplifier. 
yellow block over there is controlled by oscillator, the two transistors form the push pole, leading into the transformer, and those four diodes are the rectifier. Food talk, and uh, when you put it on the PC board, it looks a little bit like this. So we've talked about the actuation and generating the high voltage, but what triggers that? That's the sensing. The most intuitive way to measure a muscle contraction is by tapping the signal that's generated during much muscle contraction, which is the EMG signal that Colin mentioned earlier, or an electromyographic signal. Um, in order to detect this signal, we bought an external device. We bought something called the Advanced Technologies Muscle Mount, which uses a differential voltage between peak and off peak of the muscle. It amplifies it, rectifies it, and smooths it, and it's good for converting an analog input to a serial output, which we can use in our processing unit, which we'll talk about in a second. The problem we ran into here was a voltage mismatch. The muscle sensor outputs a voltage between 0 and 9 volts, and the Android is shown to take a voltage between plus and minus 0 0.1 volts. To overcome this, we installed the protection circuit. So here's a block diagram of our system. We have the muscle creating the EMG signal, leading into the muscle sensor, uh, a protection circuit in the machine, and that's our brain over there, the Android. For the protection circuit, what we did was we installed zener diodes and the voltage divider to drop that voltage to a safe range. And we also took advantage of all hands that were internal to the muscle system. Cool. So we talked a lot about the sensing side and the actuation side, uh, but we needed something to close the loop. We needed a brain or logical unit that would take in signals from the sensing side and make a logical decision as to whether the sensors, need, the actuators need to be turned on or not. So the first choice that we looked at was using an Arduino. Um, and we took signals from the muscle mouse and we looked something like this. So you're looking at just 100 milliseconds of data and the user was just relaxing their arm, so it's fairly noisy. And the solution that we saw for that was to average the samples up, like this. Uh, and when we started sampling the, using more and more samples, we needed more samples because we were averaging them out. And that's when we hit the first shortcoming that we did not have enough computing power with the RP. It, it runs at 16 megahertz, and it just did not have enough clock cycles to get the sample rate that we needed. And the problem with the Arduino was that it uh, does not have an external power source. It requires an external power source. I need to plug it into a USB to, to, to buy that. So we looked at more alternatives, and the other alternative that we looked at was using a smartphone, because every one of us has one of these in our pockets, and it's highly available. Granted, it's more expensive than an, than an Arduino, but it, the initial cost of the user is very minimal. Uh, it has much higher computing power. We're talking about gigahertz here, not megahertz. So there's an order of magnitude improvement. It's highly portable and come, come, comes with its own battery source. Uh, and it's highly configurable. Unlike an Arduino that needs to be programmed by a, by a computer programmer, these things come with a touch screen that the user can interact with to customize and personalize the experience. Right, so that's the app. That's, so I designed an app that looks something like this. It has four basic modes of operation. The first one is the muscle mouse, or the muscle uh, sensor mode of operation, where it takes in signals from the muscle sensor and averages them over time. So you're looking at about eight seconds of data here, where the user can be seen flexing their arm in the second and the fourth second. Uh, and if the value is above a certain threshold, they turn on the DC. Uh, these signals can also be saved and replayed at a later stage. Uh, third mode is the proximity sensor mode, uh, where if it needs to be tweaked a little once we get macroscopic actuation. But as it stands, uh, if, the, if there's an object in front of the proximity sensor, then it turns the DEAs on. And if it's away, it turns the DEAs off. Last mode is the manual mode. Uh, it, is more for, it is more for testing purposes, but it gives the user complete control over when to turn it off. So as, of next uh, so as of now, so we showed you an end-to-end -end of how the system should work. And now we'd like to show you a video that would do the same. Uh, here the user can be seen flexing their arm. And because we only have microscopic actuation right now, we have a laser pointing at the DAs, which magnifies the actuation, and you can see the laser dot move. So this is the power source that's powering the whole thing. Uh, this is the sensing circuit that, uh, that goes onto our Android device. And if it decides the DAs need to be turned on, it fires up the actuation circuit that generates a high voltage going to the DEAs, DEAs right here, and it points a laser dot that can be, seen, that can be used to magnify the signal. Here the user is flexing, and if you look at the dot up there, it can be seen moving to the right, to the left again, right again, and back to the left. So as you've probably realized by now, this kind of research hasn't been done at Colton before, and so we've had to start from scratch. Um, We've had to build or at least modify most of our technology to make our project work. So much so that we ended up publishing a paper in the process. We won the IEEE Student Paper Award recently, this week actually. And I'm also scheduled to give a TED talk about this, which you're all invited to if you get accepted. Um, but where do we go from here? We can achieve macroscopic actuation using our actuators. Um, we still have to achieve that. 
currently our EMG signal only senses the muscle flexing or not flexing. But if we wanted to assist our muscles, we would need to have levels of flexion in there. We have explored alternative smart materials theoretically, but it would be nice to have the resources to actually explore them experimentally as well. And we could standardize our movement file format so we could start sharing these, mo this mo these sets of movement information. Now when you extend this to an entire armband, we'd need a lot more actuators, a lot more actuation, and so we'd have to look at bulk printing or bulk fabrication of these actuators. In an armband, actuators would have to expand and compress separately, and so we'd have to consider that in the control mechanism that Vinayak developed, and in our, du in our circuit as well, we might need a dual circuit. And because of the simplistic nature of this device, you could extend it to other joints as well. You could extend it to the knee or the ankle. It depends. Um, we just have to tailor it accordingly. But where can, what can we do with what we have right now? Right now, we can, as, you, as, you, as you've seen in the video already, we can visualize muscle movements. We can visualize um, flexion. And that, that helps as a motivation tool for, for um, rehab patients, for example. We can also replay a series of movements. Now, when you extend this to an entire armband, you can use it to assist the motion of the forearm at the elbow. If you put it in a negative feedback mode, you can use it to resist your motion and so provide you with strength training for athletes, for example. Um, because, of the micros because of the millisecond response time of these actuators, you could also use this negative feedback mode to stabilize shaky arms for ALS patients. If you extend this to the entire body, as I talked about earlier, here's the kicker. You can, you can use this to store and record information through Vinayak's app. You can use it to store moves like dance moves, martial arts moves, sports moves, and you can share this with other people. You could sync armbands and teach people across the world. And you could, you could use this to sell moves just like songs, just like pictures. And say Michael Jordan shot a three-pointer. He would use this to store that move and then sell it to us just like a song. Hey, if Michael Jackson had one, I'd be moonwalking everywhere right now. Um, the point is though, we have location and time independent accelerated muscle movement. I say accelerated physical learning because it speaks directly to your muscles and therefore develops your muscle memory, bypassing that stage of getting stuck when you're learning something new. Um, we do have to thank a few people though. We have received about $500 of funding from the DOE and CSES combined to date, and we have received a lot of technical advice from members of the DOE, especially our supervisor whom we talked a lot. Thank you.